good morning or afternoon, um, wherever you are. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Henry from Master University. And today I'll be the host of this very exciting journal club in which we'll discuss the recently published paper in the journal. Um, for those of you who haven't downloaded the manuscript, you can screen capture or directly scan this QR code to access the full text of the paper. Uh, before we start, there are a few housekeeping notes that I need to deliver. If you are interested in getting involved uh, with the journals, uh, you can participate by hosting the future meeting of the Journal of Physiology's virtual journal club, like we, what we have today, or writing a journal club article on a recently published article in the Journal of Physiology, or even submitting your research to the journal. Should you have any questions, please email the editorial um, office um, via this email addresses. So now I'm going to um, now I'm going to briefly explain the structure of this um, journal club. So in the next ten minutes, I will give you a general introduction on why this paper is very relevant to discuss. Then in uh, the following twenty minutes, the senior author of the paper, whom I will introduce. Uh, shortly, we'll give an overview of the paper that we are going to discuss today. Subsequently, I will relay to you the editor's remark on why this paper was accepted for publication in the journal. Unfortunately, Professor Eli Grandi would not be able to join us today because of some technical reasons, but I'll deliver her words um, to you all for on her behalf. Then we will have then uh, around 10 minutes discussion um, and then you'll be able to submit the questions uh, at any point during the session using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. There's a tick box uh, should you wish to submit questions anonymously. However, if you are happy to give your name or institution, feel free to do so. You will also have an option to upvote should you have similar questions. Um, I would like to remind you as well that the session will be recorded and emailed to you within a week along with a feedback survey. Finally, there will be a 30 minutes um, networking session following immediately afterwards, and we encourage you to join to talk to other attendees and reflect on this uh, virtual journal club. The details on joining this networking session will be available after the Q&A session. So the title of the paper that we are going to discuss today is a physiological model of the inflammatory thermal pain cardiovascular interactions during an endotoxin challenge. And being here with us today are the first author and the senior author of the paper. Dr. Atanaska Dubreva earned a Bachelor of Art degree in Mathematics and Economics um, from Marymount University and a PhD in Mathematics from Florida State University. She did a postdoc at North Carolina State University and she is currently a postdoctoral scholar at Arizona State University. Meanwhile, Dr. Renee Brady Nichols earned her Bachelor of Science in mathematics from Florida A&M University and her PhD in applied mathematics from North Carolina State University. She's currently a research instructor at Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida. Today, Dr. Brady Nichols will um, join us in the panel discussion to answer the questions you may have. So please, if you have questions, comments, or remarks, you can write them down and um, we will discuss them shortly. Also joining us today is the senior author of the paper, Professor Mette Olofsson from the Department of Mathematics, um, North Carolina State University, Raleigh, North Carolina. Her research interests include um, biomathematics, mathematical modeling, and combining models with actual data. Moreover, she is interested in um, studying dynamics of the cardiovascular, respiratory, and inflammatory systems using fluid dynamics and system level models. After my brief introduction, Professor Olofsson will give us a short in overview of this selected paper. Uh, in addition to the authors of the paper, Professor Eleonora Grandi from the Department of Pharmacology UC Davis, which is also an editor of the journal, will give her remarks on the strength of this paper so that it was accepted for publication in the journal. In the next five minutes or so, I will give you a brief introduction on the motivation of selecting this paper to be discussed in the journal club. I will start uh, with the definition of SIRS and sepsis. SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome is a development of systemic inflammation marked by the presence of at least two signs, increased body temperature, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, 
or increase or decrease of the white blood cell count. If an incidence of SIRS is accompanied with the evidence of infection, it can be called sepsis. So overall, sepsis is a systemic inflammatory response triggered by any microorganism infections. It can develop into more severe state up to septic shock in which the impairment of the hemodynamic status can be observed. And it can also lead to death. Why is it very relevant for us to study SIRS and sepsis? Um, in the US alone, the incidence of adult SIRS documented in the emergency department was roughly 17.8% of all visits or 16.6 .6 million visits per year. Meanwhile, sepsis is the most common cause of in-hospital deaths in the US. And in 2017, there, was, uh, there were about 48.9 million cases of sepsis worldwide with 11 million sepsis related death or 19.7%. And from this world map, we can see that the incidence of sepsis and sepsis related mortality, in fact, was not the highest in the US, but in the equatorial countries with warm and hot climate, such as Mexico, South America, Africa, South and Southeast Asia. This is consistent with the facilitated growth of the infectious agents, such as bacteria and virus that become the cause of sepsis. Therefore, we can imagine that the aforementioned number would be doubled or even tripled in these countries, highlighting the significance of sepsis from the global health perspectives. Sepsis is also known to cause multi-organ dysfunction and complications. Acute infections can induce a systemic inflammation, allowing sepsis to occur. And due to the circulating inflammatory mediators, sepsis can promote both non-cardiovascular and cardiovascular complications. In the cardio, uh, cardiovascular system, sepsis can result in myocardial dysfunction and global ischemia impairing the mechanical function of the heart. Recent publication also showed that systemic inflammation could potentially induce cardiac arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, as observed in the case of post-operative atrial fibrillation. Both of the non-cardiovascular and cardiovascular complications will facilitate the progression of sepsis into severe sepsis with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, septic shock, and death. Hence, it's very crucial to stop the progression of sepsis in the early stage by performing early diagnosis and prompt treatment uh, while preserving the patient's hemodynamics. This, of course, requires a better understanding on the multi-organ uh, pathophysiology of sepsis. However, high level of comprehension is hardly attained because of several reasons. First, uh, the complex interacting signaling cascades, for example, inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen species, cellular pathologies like apoptosis, and anaerobic cell respiration. Experimentally, it's difficult to determine which component is the most responsible and thus require immediate intervention. Second, since sepsis is quickly progressive, a disease state that happens in minutes to hours, the underlying pathophysiology could be different over time. For example, the first 10 minutes of sepsis might be driven by different cytokines compared to um, the next phase of sepsis. Also, the organ damage would be more severe in the later stage, uh, limiting the eff effectivity of pharmacological interventions in the emergency department. Third, even in two patients at the same septic state, the prognosis can be different due to the interaction of patient-specific host agent environments. Uh, for example, obesity, comorbidities, virulence, nutritional status, hygiene hypothesis, um, etc. For those reasons, it's very relevant to see whether mathema mathematical modeling, which has the capability to control and observe all the parameters of interest, is beneficial to improve our understanding on these complex interactions and in the future, improve the early diagnosis and appropriate treatments of sepsis. As we know, mathematical modeling is not new in cardiovascular research. It has undergone significant development in the last 80 years and now moving towards patient-specific and personalized modeling. It integrates multi-skill aspects from atoms to organs to system to better understand, diagnose, treat, and predict the outcome of complex cardiovascular diseases. Therefore, it would be very interesting to see whether mathematical modeling can also be employed to explain the complex interaction between inflammation, thermal, pain, cardiovascular dynamics following endotoxin injection, mimicking the setting of various stages of sepsis.
Of note, the model developed by the authors is not the only model to try, uh, try to unravel this complex interaction and to predict the outcome of therapy of sepsis. In 2019, there were three newly published models with similar intention. Therefore, it would be very useful and interesting to know directly from the authors the superiority and the uniqueness of their model, and why do they think that a new and perhaps more complex model is needed to study this complex pathomechanism of sepsis. So this is the end of my introduction, and I'll give the floor to Professor Olufsen to give an overview of this interesting uh, paper. Professor Olufsen, the floor is yours. You basically already motivated why this study is of importance. So what our main motivation for working on this paper, and I think a lot of this work actually was conducted in parallel with the papers that you just mentioned. So we were not actually aware of those other publications when we wrote this paper. But since you were mentioning it, I'll try and comment a little bit on what are the differences between our paper and their papers. But these studies all happen over a long period of time and a lot of the work stemmed from Renee's PhD work and by Tanaska's work, which was really conducted simultaneously with those studies that you were mentioning before. So our main motivation for studying this system was our continuous interaction with clinicians at Rigshospitalet in Denmark and one of the things that they really have noticed, and they're working mostly on studying the autonomic regulation, is that for patients, not only those who undergo sepsis, but a lot of patients in common surgeries like hip replacements, knee replacements, the new idea is that you really want patients to get out of bed very fast, typically the day of their surgery, but some faint and some show in, in excessive inflammatory responses. And so the idea was really, we have signals that we can monitor continuously, non-invasively and very easily, which is heart rate and blood pressure. And then we know that, that in all these patients, they probably have an extensive inflammatory response, but it's not as easy to monitor um, invasively and continuously at the time uh, of the surgery. So if we could get a better understanding of how the underlying inflammation impacts these easy to assess signals that will help us understand how to better diagnose patients that have problems and therefore maybe shouldn't get out of bed right out of surgery or should be treated for sepsis uh, early on because early detection is the only key to treat some of these uh, diseases. And what we started to learn when we started to look at this problem is that very little was actually known on how the inflammatory response impact the cardiovascular response. There were other, the other way around, how the cardiovascular response impact the inflammatory response had been studied in much more detail from an experimental situation. So a lot of this is really hypothesis generating. So we are gonna use our model to generate a hypothesis and then we are gonna match the model to individual data. The other point we wanted to make is that uh, when we are looking at data from inflammation, there's a huge individual variation. And so to capture that variation, it's important to build a patient-specific model where we can use some of our tools for learning about primary estimation to, to build models that can capture that variation we see in patients. And finally, uh, the last part is that at the time we started this project, most models existing in literature were built based on animal models and the inflammatory response is significantly different in humans than it is in the animal models. So this study really focuses on, uh, on building models from patient data. And we, to our knowledge, there are only very few groups that actually have inflammatory data from the cytokines in humans because it's a only a few groups worldwide are uh, having the approvals to actually do these measurements. So that's why modeling is important because we can get a better understanding of what's going on. So generally our model has an inflammatory component where we are tracking pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-8, which uh, sometimes is called CXL8, and IL-6 and IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory marker. We track 
LPS, which is an endotoxin that's administered in the paper we were discussing the effect of a bolus injection. But I'm going to make some comments on how the responses changes when you're giving a continuous uh, dose, which is closer to what you see happens in the sepsis patients. And then we want to track really what happens continuously to heart rate and blood pressure over time. And so for this particular study, we are having inflammatory data, heart rate and blood pressure and temperature and pain measured in 20 healthy young adults. And we are trying to understand the response and the interaction between these two components. And to the right here, you see some of the data that we have from heart rate, temperature, blood pressure and pain threshold. And another thing we did in this study, which is important is that we used the model not only on the data that we were gathered, but also on other data that was gathered and published in previous studies. And we'll discuss some of the differences that there are between these types of data sets. So you were asking how we are different from these uh, three studies that you mentioned earlier. So the study from Yamanaka et al is probably the one that's uh, closest to what we are doing. So the main difference is, is that we have a more detailed inflammatory model. They have a more detailed cardiovascular model. We have more detailed data. And the other thing is we do a more systematic work on making the model patient specific in the parameter estimation concept. And I think that's one of the highlights of our group that we are using those techniques for different studies. The model from Sao et al, to my knowledge, was only a simulation study, so it doesn't get into the patient-specific type modeling. And the model by McDaniel et al uses BioGears, which is actually developed by a company here very close to us, namely Kitware. And while their model is interesting, it provides a lot of details, but it cannot provide these patient-specific simulations. And the more details you have, the harder it is to make a model patient specific. So that's, I guess, the take home on where we are compared to these studies. And I'll be happy to take questions um, if you guys have more insight. So first, the data. So we have data from 20 healthy young adults that are given a dose of endotoxin, and then they are measuring IL-10, IL-8, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, which somehow did make it into this graph. And what you notice here is that we have a wide variation of the response, especially note IL-10 here. We have some patients that we actually decided to call abnormal because they have a really high anti-inflammatory response. You can see the same thing here. We have some patients in the IL-6 that are very different from the mean. So the question is, can we really try and capture some of these differences? And what is really the difference between these underlying patients? And these are all healthy controls. So none of them are gone into sepsis. So the experiment was set up as follows. So LPS was administered at time zero, but data was measured also at minus time two, so two hours before LPS was administered to get like a control baseline. And so we were discuss measuring the inflammatory markers at all these red lines until six hours after administration. So the whole experiment lasted eight hours. Pain th uh, threshold was uh, measured at minus two hours, at two hours and at six hours. Temperature and blood pressure was measured at these time. Blood pressure was also measured continuously, but there was a too much variation in the phenopress measurement. So we chose to use the uh, cough measurements that were measured at the group intervals right here. Heart rate was measured uh, continuously via an EKG. The model that we have uh, consists of the following components. And this diagram is not in the paper, but that's basically what's going to happen. So we have an immune response where we have pro, pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And you were mentioning the other paper that has this, but it doesn't distinguish all the different cytokines. It just has pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Then we have the link to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, so it goes in and affects blood pressure via dilation of the systemic resistance. Also, we have an effect on the inflammatory cytokines to temperature, which makes you get a fever. And having a fever, the temperature control center is very close to the blood pressure control center, 
So that goes in and affects the stimulation of heart rate. And then heart rate, again, actually goes back and infinite blood pressure, but that's mostly on the beat to beat level and we haven't, don't have that in the model. Pain also is a directly stimulated by the endotoxin and then that goes in and affects blood pressure. So to study the system, we set up a system of equations that describes the resting monocytes, the activated monocytes, the pro-inflammatory markers, TNF, IL-6, and IL-8, and IL-10. We chose to include these pro-inflammatory markers because A, these ones have been used in previous studies, and B, they're the ones that we have data for. Now, there was a discussion of whether we should include IL-1 beta. We didn't have data for it, and there's been a lot of discussion of whether that's actually important here or not. It could be that the only reason we don't have data is because that's how the specific blood sample was handled. And the experimentalists that we talked to said, well, in future studies, they would like to include that as well. Um, some of the previous uh, models on the inflammatory response had a more detailed uh, response in the beginning, also including um, not only including the resting and activated microphages, but since we don't have data, we decided to just lump the response into, into this a model of this type. And so in brief, what's happening is that by the in, uh, dolus response of endotoxin, which is E in our model, that upregulates the production of activated uh, mic, uh, macrophages, and which is then going away from the resting monocytes. And then the activated monocytes is decaying at a rate KMA, which is just a regular exponential decay. And the resting monocytes is keep being produced in a logistic type fashion. So then that activates TNF alpha. So here you have the TNF alpha is activated by the activated monocyte. It's also downregulated by IL-10. It's downregulated uh, by IL-6, and then it's decaying towards uh, its resting level in an exponential fashion. And all the upregulating and downregulating, and it's common in these types of inflammatory model, follows this kind of health type, of, health type function, which has a half saturation value, which is eta yx. And that's problematic because we don't actually know what that half saturation value is. So that's one of the parameters we would like to know. And then it has an H here, which kind of indicate the steepness of this curve. So this is an example of upregulation. And here you have an example of downregulation. So IL-6 is interesting because it's both uh, downregulating itself and being upregulated by IL-6. It's upregulating IL-10, and it also has an interaction with the activated mac macrophages. But you can see the actual equations in the paper. So the point here is, is this a model which has a lot of parameters? We have all the rates. We have all the parameters in this upregulation and downregulation. So I think there was a total of like 40 parameters in the inflammatory component alone. Then we have the interaction with temperature, with pain, and the nitric oxide. And here we had a long discussion of the response in humans versus response in animals, because one study that we got data from was the Copeland study, where they actually showed that temperature does not go up. So that was one of the characteristics of the human response as opposed to the animal response. But rather than going into that debate, we decided to only discuss the human response here. So temperature is upregulated by TNF. It's downregulated by, well, I guess also kind of downregulated by IL-10. And then there is an internal um, decay to the minimum temperature or that the baseline temperature, which is 30, 37 degrees. Uh, pain, which is really more like a discrete signal. So they have like a heat probe that's put on your arm that gives a pain stimulus and it measures the pain threshold. Uh, follows the equation of this form. Introduction. Uh, endotoxin lowers the pain threshold. So when the pain threshold is low, that means that you experience more pain. Okay, so the lower the pain threshold, the more pain that you're in. So it's kind of the opposite type effect. Nitric oxide is a delayed response and that's very important because it takes time to build up nitric oxide. So you can see here that it's 
uh, related to TNF alpha, but with a delay, a time delay kappa here. And that's what makes that whole mechanism work together is introducing this delay. So even though we don't have data for nitric oxide, it's a very important component to include, but it's a very fast acting agent. So it's hard to actually get data for it. So we need to base our model just on um, the phenological response that you see. Here is a cardiovascular model. It's like a circuit type model. So we actually developed this model in addition so this uh, heart rate model is a steady state model. So we are predicting the flow of the heart rate as heart rate times stroke volume. So we are not looking at the pulsatile response, which is not important because we are studying things over hours, not over minutes. And so the cardiovascular control goes in and affect the vascular resistance. And in this model, we only have the systemic circulation. And the other paper that was mentioned before, they included both the systemic and the pulmonary circulation. But for the particular interaction we are looking at, it's not as important to include both the systemic and the pulmonary circulation because the pressure that we are looking at is really the large artery pressure response. And it won't really be, we are not looking at oxygen we're not looking at the respiratory feedback here, which may have an impact to try and keep the model simpler. And then we have, so we are modeling the control by looking at how the vascular resistance depends on nitric oxide because it's a vasodilator. So increase in nitric oxide will decrease resistance. And then it also is impacted by the pain threshold. So in, when you're in pain, your vessels tends to constrict and that's included in this equation. We had an equation for heart rate and this is not the instantaneous bare reflex response to heart rate because we again, remember we are looking at the response over hours. So it's more like how the baseline of this heart rate control is affected by having an inflammation. So it's very tricky because not very much actually known. There's been a lot of studies who have looked at the minute to minute or beat by beat change in heart rate. This is a more long-term effect, but it's not like the kidney, neuro, kidney really long-term effect you get from hypertension because we're in this intermediate range where we're looking at the response over hours. So, so, so that made it very tricky to build this model because we really didn't have a lot of things to go by because until this paper came out in 2019, not very many people have actually studied uh, the response. And uh, we had a lot of discussion with actually reviewers of papers, how to model these equations and how to mod modulate them. So heart rate is impacted by blood pressure primarily, but then blood pressure is impacted by resistance, which is impacted by nitric oxide and pain. So indirectly, we have this coupled response in the model. So the idea here is that we wanted to estimate parameters and then match the model to data. Now, think about this. This is a model with 50 parameters, but data from the inflammatory markers, blood pressure, and heart rate. So we don't have a lot of data. So it's very sparse in the data domain. So the one thing we figured out is that all the parameters that has to do with upregulation and downregulation, they were very difficult to estimate. So we kept those fixed and worked mo focused mostly on the rate constant. And we used some ideas that uh, Renee had learned actually after she started her postdoc in trying to understand what are population specific parameters and what are patient specific parameters. So some parameters were estimating over the whole population and others were varying to get the patient to patient variation that we see. And so once we spend a lot of time figuring out what are the identifiable parameters and the ones that we can estimate on the patient by patient data. So here are some examples. Uh, Professor Olofsson, yeah. you have three minutes to go. Okay, so I'm just gonna focus on this part and then we're gonna um, move on to the discussion. So here we can see the, the fit of the model to the Copeland data, which is a different assaying of the cytokine. So we are not gonna get exactly the same response as we did to our data. So especially you can see that, uh, I think it's IL-8 has a very different response, which is probably due to how the cytokines have been assayed. But the model was able to fit the data well. 
And when we go into this thing here, you can see we are looking at the black curve is estimating all 18, estimating 18 of the 15 parameters. And in the gray curve is when we are keeping the population parameters fixed and only estimate the patient specific parameters to get individual responses. We then use each response to study the effect of a number of different treatments. And I'm not gonna really go into that a lot, just saying that we did LPS adsorption, antipyretics, vasopressors, and multimodal therapies. And we did that for each patient. And what we could, uh, what we then tracked in the end uh, is we track all the different types of responses that you can see for each patient. So this is kind of just illustrating that for the sustained endotoxemia, you can get this very big range of responses. And that's what may give us more insight into what sepsis is doing. Because just from looking at these 20 patients that are um, all healthy, you can see that when you're starting to impose treatments on a patient by patient basis, you can get different types of responses. And this is where I think our models differ from some of the other models is that we can go in and try to understand if we have this type of patient specific response, how does a specific treatment work for that patient? So for example, here, when we do LPS absorption and antipyretics, you can see some patients remain hypotensive after they are given a treatment while some recover and get their pressure back in their normal response. And I think that type of knowledge is important when we need to move forward to build math models that can uh, uh, provide early capture of sepsis. And I guess the very last slide I would like to show now is that we try to take our model and then model a continuous response. This is not in the paper, it's a new study. Our nice model, well-validated model doesn't work if we were in a switch from a bolus dose to a continuous dose. So there's more stuff to be studied to understand what then really is happening when we move forward to get a continuous dose because the sepsis is more like the continuous dose. Is the model wrong? We are in a, a debate with some of the clinicians to understand how to fix these things and figure out what in the model needs to be adapted to study a continuous infusion. And then from there on, we can move forward and understand what happens in the sepsis case. So I just want to say that I didn't do much of this work. Most of this work was done by Renee, who's here, and by Atanaska, who's a postdoc who couldn't be here today. And then by Kristen, who is a new graduate student who is starting out working on this project. And then we are in continuous debate with the group at Risse Hospital in Denmark. And we recently started also talking to the Peters group in Nijun, which is in Holland as well. It's hard for me to pronounce these Dutch names, um, who are some of the only studies who really have extensive data on different dosing strategies, which I think is an important part to move forward in, in, in really understanding what happens when we can, so we can get better um, insight into diagnosing sepsis early. I think I'm going Thank to you. stop there. Okay. Thank you for your uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I think the model is very nice. And um, before we go to the Q&A session, uh, I would like to read the remarks from uh, Professor Grundy, where, uh, who is not here with us today. Um, but I would like to encourage people or the attendees, if uh, you have questions, you can write down your questions in the Q&A um, um, column or, um, yeah. And we will discuss that in the session. Um, yeah, so um, basically, um, Professor Grundy has um, sort of constructed that there are four um, sub sections or sub, um, oh, yeah, like four subjects basically to evaluate from this paper. So the first one is novelty and quote, the novel, uh, the model ties together for the first time inflammatory response, autonomic reflexes, body temperature, cardiovascular function, and pain response. By integrating this phenomena, it allows simulating their mutual influences in the response to endotoxin in infusion. Uh, 
from the perspective of rigor, the model is constructed and identified in a rigorous way using two independent data sets obtained in humans for calibration and validation. From the perspective of new predictions that can inform novel experiments, the model is used to make new uh, predictions by analyzing the response to a range of individual and combined therapeutic approaches. Importantly, these new predictions are amenable to uh, experimental testing and could provide new insight into treatment. And from the point of uh, impact, the model is a new valuable tool for the scientific community. It can be used to gain new mechanistic understanding of the processes by which autonomic reflexes, body temperature, cardiovascular function, and pain response interact upon inflammatory insults, and to study the mechanisms by which treatment can be effective and thus improve therapy. So those are the remarks from uh, Professor Grandi, and it seems that they are very, very um, positive. And um, I think we can now go to the Q&A session. So please um, upload your question if you have. Uh, I can start with one. Um, so Professor Olofsson, um, I'm interested um, when I see your diagram, it shows that um, you suggest uh, you basically linked a lot of stuff there um, from the, oh yeah, uh, Renee, mm -hmm. are you there? Yeah. Hi, Renee. Okay. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm happy that you can join us um, in the panel today. So mm -hmm. I will ask like, yeah, basically um, Professor Olofsson and also you uh, as the first author of this paper. Um, when I see the diagram that uh, Professor Olofsson shows us in the, um, in the presentation, it shows that um, none of them has the negative feedback at least. Um, do you have any reason why not to include, for example, the, uh, the relation between blood pressure and heart rate? We know that heart rate, um, for example, in physiology, we know that blood pressure is, the, is, um, is um, constructed from the cardiac output times uh, heart rate. So um, heart rate can also influence blood pressure. And also from your diagram, it shows that blood pressure can also affect heart rates. Um, do you have any um, arguments why not? Yes, so, this? so this is where the, the thing I mentioned quite briefly, and Renee, you may want to comment on that as well, because we spent a long time discussing that. Um, so the bare reflex control happens over minutes, right? And that, that's what you are basically mentioning here. We know that heart rate impacts blood pressure, blood pressure impacts heart rate, and we understand the bare reflex control pretty well. However, we are not looking at, we are assuming that the system is always in, in a um, steady state in terms of the fast response, because the fast response is not included in the data. So modeling the do, and I remember when we constructed at some point a diagram, that negative feedback response actually leads to complete wrong prediction of the inflammatory response. Right. I don't think we really got it through in the paper, but we spent a lot of time trying to sort that out. And we think it's because the fast response here is you're not going to see that because we don't have data that goes at that level of detail because you're going to see that only at the minute level not at the hour level so what you're really seeing here is how the inflammatory response impact the cardiovascular response at a long-term response like the hour response so how is the baseline of the uh, of the um baseline of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems change because of the inflammation. So like the baseline steady state firing of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, and that's modulated. And that's exactly actually a positive feedback, not a negative feedback, at least to our understanding. But I don't think this, this question is completely resolved. And I think more work is needed to actually try and examine that in detail. Do you have anything to add, Renee? No, I think you pretty much covered it. I, re I remember running the, the other simulations and it wasn't fitting the model very well. Yeah. So we, we took it out for the time being. It could be something worth investigating later though. But there is an interaction between the short-term response and the, and the long-term response, which 
we just focus to not include it because the, it's not a negative feedback with the inflammatory system. It actually causes a positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have one question here from Ali Reza Mani. Uh, I hope I pronounced uh, the name correct, uh, correctly here. So thank you for your nice work. Some patients show hypothermia following sepsis. Did you observe development of hypothermia in your model? Our model can't do hypothermia mm -hmm. uh, because the baseline temperature is the normal temperature. We did discuss it. And so the model that we have right now in its current form needs a little bit of further developing if you actually have to use it to, to study sepsis. And some of our new development that Kristen is working on um, will actually get to the point of trying to do, do sepsis where you can have hypothermia. But yeah, that's right, because you, you should be able to uh, regulate temperature both up and down. And we do have some data from sepsis studies where they did measure cytokines, uh, but we are currently working on going from the bolus dose to the continuous dose, because when you get into toxin over a longer period of time, as opposed to just a short period of time, there are some differences in the response that we are also not capturing. Okay, um, probably, it's interesting also to discuss about the future direction of this model. So are, are you going to, for example, like add more pa patients to, to validate this, or are you going to include more signaling um, cytokines, for example, or? So yeah. I think at the moment, what we are going towards is trying to look at different dosing strategies and different doses. Another thing we have talked about is the relation with the tissue damage, because we have some data from patients with knee surgery that has got, undergone knee surgery. I don't think we're going to do more cytokines, probably rather less, because mm -hmm. when you have clinical data, you don't have more cytokines. And adding more complex models like the BioGears model is a great model, but it has so many components and so many parameters. And Renee, you can maybe comment on that a little bit that the whole idea is that you really need to balance complexity versus being able to work on something you can talk about from large patient groups. And I don't know if you wanna, could add a little bit on your experience with working with patient specific versus population specific parameters. And what's important if you wanna do model validation, actual validation. Yeah, I think it's just important to remember what, what the question is. What are we trying to accomplish with each of our models? And um, adding in more components now is going to require more data one way or another. And if we don't have access to the data, then we're making assumptions that we can't necessarily back up. So I think I agree with Meta where if we can take out some components out of the model, that would be ideal. Right now we have 50 parameters. So adding in more cytokines and not necessarily having the data for it would probably not be the best route. Um, as far as the parameter estima estimation goes, with 50 parameters to begin with, we had to um, break it down even further into the population and to the, the uniform parameters to really understand what was driving the dynamics. And that, that also could have been accomplished by minimizing the model, but then we wouldn't be, um, we, wouldn't, we probably wouldn't be able to model all of the different interactions all at once. So, the next best thing to that was to minimize the parameter set as best as we could with understanding, um, looking at all of, the, all of the parameters being patient specific and then analyzing them individually to determine which of them are, are driving the dynamics. So, yep. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Yeah, and uh, one thing we notice when you try and estimate parameters in this type of models, which is composed of upregulation and downregulation, is a lot of the times these uh, responses end up in their saturated effect, either at the high level or at the low level, because it's very it's a very nonlinear mathematical system, so it's tricky to do. So it's better, as Renee said, to simplify, keep things fixed. Uh, make assumptions based on what you can to really tease out what's the mechanics. Yeah. Uh, we have one final question here from Ali Reza as well. So thank you. In your model, you predicted the effect of antipyretics. What was the uh, what was mathematical assumption for antipyretics? Have you considered prost prostaglandins in your model since most antipyretics suppress prostaglandin synthesis? Mm -hmm. 
I would say no. So these were more like general studies and I wish Atanaska was here because I'm <laughs> sure she could answer that question because a lot of that was her work. Um, if you want, I can, if you can email me the question, I will email the question to Atanaska and she can actually provide a better response on that. Um, but we just looked at generalized treatment ideas, what has been used, what are the common things you could do to just see what happens. It's like conducting what if simulations to show that if you have a specific treatment, you can then target that treatment to what you're doing by changing things in the model and see how, it, uh, how the model reacts. I think the main point we wanted to get across is that when you take a treatment and apply that at the patient specific level, you get different outcomes. Yeah. So these are more hypothetical treatments. And I think if somebody wants to take this work, what they need to know is just that if you have a specific patient with a specific hypothesized treatment, then you can see what's the effect of treating that patient. And I know Renee, you have worked a lot on that, not for this model, but for prostate cancer. And it's kind of the same idea. Um, right. These are just model simulations that we can use to motivate um, further experimental studies or clinical studies. And then of course, if you have the data now to back up these simulations, then you can build in the mechanism um, more carefully. So what we do, I think, I, of course, Meta asked Atanaska to answer the question more specifically, <clears throat> but the specific mechanism that we used for antipyretics was, was more general. And then if we actually had the data to back it up, then we could validate our simulations to determine if we need to build more into it or take, take something out of it. Okay. Perfect. Um, I think that was a really, really nice discussion. And um, I would like to remind everyone that we still have the networking session after this. And um, I think Rosie will uh, share us the link. So basically, if you are interested, you can join us and discuss further. Um, the, the, the issue about antipyretics or other, or other issue that um, might come up. Um, you can just click the link and then I'll see you there. We'll see you there um, as well. So thank you for joining us um, in today's uh, general club. And we will see you uh, again in the next session of the general club. Thank you. <laughs>